you know, in the last year, UCLA inside products, medical devices, four of them received FDA approval. So this is, exactly, so this is remarkable and exciting. And we are very fortunate to have here today two luminaries of their field. Both of them developed very uh, similar but different innovative products that received FDA approval are in the marketplace. So without further ado, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Adahali, if you can just tell us a little bit about your day job in UCLA. First of all, thank you very much for the invitation here. This has been an incredibly uh, um, inspiring conference today. Um, I'm a faculty in the School of Medicine. I um, uh, did my training at uh, UCSF and have been at, the, at UCLA for the past 30 some years. Um, I'm a professor of surgery and a d director of a heart and lung transplant program here at UCLA, which is one of the largest programs in, in the country. And um, I spend most of my time operating on patients and taking care of patients in the, uh, at the main hospital here at Ronald Reagan. Right. And, and Rick, you come, Dr. Kenner, you come from a very different background. Yes, I'm, I'm a professor in chemistry and biochemistry with a joint appointment in material science and engineering. And I work on new materials and I've been at UCLA 36 years, I think. So, so, so let's, let's explore that for a second. You're, can I call you a, a basic researcher, someone who deals with basic research? So I spent 20 years doing basic research, but I would say the last 15 have been applied. So I always said, we, have, we make these new materials. If we did two more steps, they'd be products. And then I realized that doesn't happen unless you do it yourself. So, so, so what triggered that interest or that realization that you have to do some INE activity in your, in your career? So I like to say, I, I was at a conference one time, and I was talking to a, a friend of mine from grad school who worked at Exxon, now Exxon Mobil. And he was talking about using some of our research for one of his products. And I said, would you like to license the patent? And he said, no, we just work around those. <laughs> so at, at that point, I realized if, if you're going to do something, you're going to need to do it yourself. So Dr. Adahali, you, you uh, your uh, initiative, well, tell us about the need. How did you identify the need uh, uh, for your innovative canola? And, and, and uh, what were the first steps in that journey? Well. Um, as many of you know, I deal with uh, patients with end-stage heart and lung disease, the patients who have no other options. They have failed all medical therapies and surgical therapies. Over the past 10 years, a new technology called ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which is a technology that supports or replaces the human heart and lungs. And that technology supports these patients until they get uh, heart and lung transplantation. And I still remember one of these, one of those days taking care of some of the, one of these patients, and um, this patient had lung failure, could not breathe, and had this catheter in their heart so that we could take out the bad oxygenated blood and oxygenate it and put it back into the patient. And there was a clear uh, deficiency in the catheter. This is a catheter that has been marketed and uh, by one of the giants in the field. And um, I sat down and actually, believe it or not, draw it on a napkin. And over the course of the next um, several weeks to months, I continued to think about it. And once it had developed into something a little bit more tangible, I, uh, being a faithful UCLA professor, I disclosed it to the UCLA Technology Development Group. And um, those days, with the help of some of their um, advisors and, uh, and attorneys, we, um, and with their, without a question, without their great help, we submitted it for a, uh, a provisional patent. And the rest of it is something that, should I go through now, or? So, so let, let's ask Dr. Kainer about his first step, because uh, Dr. you have, uh, if I remember certainly right, you started with uh, a water purification company. You have an active company that manufactures next generation batteries. Yes. But we're here today to discuss uh, a coating for a catheter. Yes. How did you arrive to a medical device company? So one of my colleagues, Eric Hook in civil engineering, heard one of my lectures and asked me if I could help him design a membrane to separate oil from water. And we did that, and it's commercial. It helps clean up the mess left from oil fracking. And after we finished that, he said, I got another problem. When you do reverse osmosis, the membranes get clogged. And so they got to be back flushed every few hours. 
in, in production. And he said, if you could develop a hydrophilic coating, we could solve that problem. So we spent six years, we developed a hydrophilic coating, and then we looked at the business case for it, and like many academics, we solved a problem that doesn't actually exist. Turns out, yes, they back flush the membranes, but that works. And so the coating would, would save them a little bit of time, a little bit of money, but nobody's gonna pay for it. But at that point, I started a couple other companies, and one of the people running the company is a physician, and so he asked what other technology I had. He looked at this, and he's like, have you thought about coding medical devices? And I said, well, I've thought about it. He's like, no, you need to do this seriously. And we looked, and the worst device in the clinic is a catheter. In this case, a urinary catheter, but the infection rate's 5% per day from the time you put it in. So we started coding catheters. We got FDA clearance, which I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about. We started putting in patients, and we've had remarkable success. Great. So, uh, Dr. Adarhali, so we finished your story or started your story with the provisional patent application, and then what, what came next? After, what, what other resources in UCLA did you use in this journey? Right. Um, I was fortunate enough to, obviously, working with uh, TDG, and they guided me with um, uh, the opportunities that are available. One of them was a new um, venture called uh, Center for Accelerated Innovations, which came before some of the um, centers that you've already discussed today. And um, so I, um, I applied to that, and uh, believe it or not, the first time I, I didn't get the award, and um, they advised me to try again. And, um, and sure enough, the second time we were fortunate enough to be uh, the recipient of the award, which is a nominal amount. And then um, I was uh, um, fortunate to actually have the support of the, um, the Vice Chancellor for the Health and um, through uh, Patricia Roderick's support, whom I don't know if she's I here. think she was here. Yeah, she's here over there. And through her support, we were able to um, embark on a, uh, and believe it or not, at this stage, this is just a drawing. This is, I did not have a prototype. And um, we um, uh, co collaborated with an outside company to develop a few prototypes. Once we had the prototypes, we, um, with the help of the same group of um, really committed individuals, we were able to pitch it to a few companies. These are some of the companies that have known me or have known about some of the work that we've done and uh, we had some of the largest multinational companies coming through campus and looking at the, at the catheter. Um, and after multiple discussions, we identified one of the companies called Spectrum Medical, whom we felt was the best partner for us. Not necessarily the largest, but the best partner for this specific catheter. And keep in mind that this is about the time that COVID was about to happen and there was a clear need for ECMO and variety of cannulas for support of these patients. And I'll leave it as such, and I'll come back to it through the FDA process after you. So, so before we go there, can you give us some you know, marks or characteristics of what made Spectrum a good partner? Um, the first and foremost was that, um, obviously, some of the topics that we discussed earlier, which is the team the players of the company that we felt are committed to making this technology a clinical reality. They understood exactly what the unmet need is and the fact that this is going to require FDA approval and some changes and some modifications and then effective marketing strategy. They were in this space and we felt very comfortable. And I can tell you that the reason that we felt comfortable it was because of the collaboration of many individuals here at UCLA, some of them sitting right there back, back of the room with Dr. Gasson and many others that made it possible. I certainly could not have done this without the collaboration of some of the talented staff in TDG and beyond within the UCLA ecosystem to make it possible. So Dr. Kerry, you did not work with an established company. You opened your own startup company. Why is that? So basically, I had these backers, and they were interested in starting our own company. We got an exclusive license from TDG, from UCLA, and we also write a contract back to my lab. So we can do the basic research part in my lab, 
with certain caveats and, and certain um, things we have to go through. But, but that way, and then the company has a, a place outside where, where we do the work and, and actually make products. So, so I, I think when we talk about you, you mentioned uh, how uh, critical substantial was the, uh, the space in CNSI in Magnify for, for the success of this project. So actually, Magnify is very useful for many companies. Ours, we actually were able to utilize some of our own space because, because we have a contract back directly to the university, pay full overhead, it, and, and go through all the conflict of interest. We, we can do that. Okay. So, so in your uh, journey to get FDA approval, what was your role as the inventor scientist when you know, all these companies coming together and, and you know, raising money and has the, I, I guess, advisors and, and people who are experts in clinical development? Yeah, so I serve as the um, chief scientific advisor for, for the company. And um, my former student who developed the coding, what, what we're making is a zwitterionic polymer. So it has a, a layer of water on it and it prevents bacteria and fungi from sticking. And so to get FDA clearance, what we had to do is prove through third party testing that our, our thing was safe and that, it, it, that nothing came off. And we learned during the FDA process, they keep changing the rules, and so they wanted more and more testing. And so for me, it seemed like an eternity. It took us two years to get our first clearance. I've been told that that's actually relatively fast, but then again, this, you know. And um, we'll, we'll show you a, a video in a little while of, of one of our patients, but one of the neat uses for our catheter is called suprapubic use, where it goes through tissue, the FDA, in order to approve that, wanted much more testing because it's going through human tissue. And so that took us another two years. And in fact, it's only last month that we got our, our clearance for, for that use. And, and so, Dr. Adrahali, uh, what was your role in, in working with Spectrum in, in getting the to FDA approval? Right, so once um, uh, Spectrum Medical uh, acquired the uh, licensure, then the next step was um, obviously developing the in vitro studies and uh, some animal studies, and then uh, accumulation of the data for submission to the uh, FDA. Um, I personally had developed a, a good relationship with the team there, visited there on multiple occasions, and worked with them through the process to ensure that it worked in a seamless fashion and we acquired all the data that was necessary. My experience, unlike yours, was, was quite fast. And um, in our experience, it took less than probably a year to go through the uh, 510K and to be able to get the, uh, the approval. Once we got the FDA approval, the company was not quite ready to actually go into the mass uh, scale because uh, it would take him a little bit of time. They, they, could not, they did not expect that it would go this fast through the FDA. So although it was approved um, about a year and a half ago, but they were not able to actually start marketing it until about um, eight or nine months ago. So, so Rick, if, if there's someone here in the audience that uh, you know, uh, is a tenure track faculty and is considering whether or not they should you know, fight for a patent, uh, go down this route, what, what advice will you give them? Yeah, so I tell all faculty, if you have something that you think might be patentable, you should talk to your office and, and patent it because you can always file a preliminary patent, as we heard, and then you guys figure out whether somebody's gonna pay for, for a full-on full patent. With company formation, I tell people, make sure you have tenure before you start companies because it takes an enormous amount of time. and. As we well know, the odds of success are not great. They're probably less than, less than two in 10. But the ones that do succeed can often succeed in a spectacular fashion. So it's definitely worth doing. And the education you get, I mean, I've interacted with people at the Anderson Business School. I've interacted with people in law at the California Nano Systems Institute. There are great people, and everybody is willing to help you. And so I've learned, learned a great deal that way. So uh, a follow-up question to, for, for both of you. Both of you have been in UCLA for a very long time. Um, talk about the culture shift or culture change in UCLA around INE activity. Well, I think from my perspective, um, there has been a, uh, a dramatic change. I think that when I started, it was actually looked down upon if you wanted to think about new technology, 
companies, innovation. My job was to take care of patients and publish. And that was the, the totality of, of our, the expectation. I think over the past decade, there has been a uh, seismic shift in terms of what the, what the missions of this institution is. And, and I really think that that has become for the better. Because we, as as group, we are at the forefront of some of um, the the most advanced care that that can be delivered, and there is no question that virtually every week there is an unmet need that we think about, and I think it has uniquely positioned us to be able to ask questions. We can't answer most of the questions, but at least ask the questions, and that has been a uh, a dramatic change in the academic environment at UCLA, and I hope beyond. Yeah, I completely agree with your assessment. Um, when I first got here, people were like, okay, you've got patents, that's fine, but we don't talk about that. And now it's like part of the decision for promotions and so on. And so and we're encouraged to file patents, we're encouraged to start companies. They even hold seminars uh, for faculty on how to start companies and for, for others, and there's incubators here. So the culture has changed dramatically. And I'm happy to say in the last month, I've gotten my 70th U.S. patent issued. That's great. So, so going back to your uh, inventions, uh, Dr. Adahali, you actually are privileged enough to use your own invention on UCLA patients, right? Can you tell us the story around that? Sure. Um, I think the, the first... Um, use that I had was in, in a patient, a young gentleman, 27-year-old, who was actually at St. John's in Santa Monica who had acquired COVID because he did not want to be vaccinated. He had developed uh, lung failure or he couldn't breathe. So they, as you know, we put tubes in their mouth and put them on the ventilator for weeks. And he wasn't doing well. And they called us because he's young and he may need a lung transplant. So we transferred him here. And he was already on ECMO with the older cannulas that were being used, but he was not just getting enough oxygen. And um, that was in the month of November, and the FDA had approved the product in November, and there was only one size available, the 31, which is the largest size. And I had never put one in. I don't think anybody in this country has put, had put one in. But in this specific case, we felt that uh, this is the only chance that this gentleman had and uh, we had to um, courier the first um, catheter that was ever shipped from the company to UCLA, and we used it uh, the next day. Miraculously, things turned around, and he's, he was awake, and he was doing fine. And after three months of use, um, there were cracks, which is understandable, in the catheter, and we had to put a new catheter in him. And after being on ECMO, which is being in the ICU for about nine months, he finally got his uh, lung transplant at UCLA about three months ago, and uh, he got married in the hospital. He has a daughter now, and, uh, and he's doing well. So I think that um, stories like this really, really inspires you to do what we do every day, and, um, and it has been through the, a team effort and an ecosystem that exists here that has made this possible. I've been fortunate enough to have used this catheter much more frequently than a few instances. And, um, and I think that this has been a, uh, a change in the way we take care of patients and, uh, and hopefully a step in the right direction. So Dr. Kerner, you shared a video with us. Do you, say, you want to say a few words before we share the video? Sure, should I say what's, what's yeah. good? Okay, so something that, that you experienced as a physician, but I as a chemist never expected to actually help people directly. And so you're gonna see a video of one of our first patients. So we were coding these catheters, preventing things from, from growing on them. And this woman is in her 30s and she has muscular dystrophy. So she's confined to a wheelchair. And she constantly has to have catheters, but she has an unfortunate situation that when a biofilm forms, which it always does, it reacts with her urine to form salt crystals. And so within four or five days, her catheter is blocked. It smells bad and she's in terrible pain. So she has to have this medical procedure. And so her physician and her were desperate. They heard about our work. Her physician ordered our catheter, even though at the time we weren't approved for super pubic use, the physician could order that. And so after they put this catheter in, she now comes in every three weeks. 
The catheters are clean. They took her off all her antibiotics. And so she came here last year to thank us for personally changing her life. And she shot this video for us. And she said she just has one request. And that is that we do for everybody in her situation what we've done for her. So I've gotten to learn firsthand what it's like to, to work with patients. Infections, whether contracted in a hospital or through some other means, are a serious problem in terms of patient health and are a multi-billion dollar burden on the healthcare system. We've used antibiotics to treat them for decades, but the problem is that antibiotics have been overused and bacteria are increasingly able to negate their effect, giving rise to new strains of antibiotic-resistant superbugs. There is an urgent need, therefore, for a solution which addresses the problem of infection at its very core. Silk has developed a groundbreaking treatment technology that can be applied to the surfaces of many implanted medical devices to protect against bacterial aggregation and the growth of biofilm. The treatment is intended to stop infections before they even begin. Furthermore, surfaces treated with silk formulations exhibit enhanced lubricity and reduced tack, which provide greater patient comfort during implant and explant our patented technology is the result of years of research in the field of material science. Our first product to market is a silk clear tract indwelling Foley catheter, which has now been cleared for sale in the U.S. by the FDA. Patients and clinicians report dramatically improved comfort and reduced catheter encrustation and less visits to the clinic due to complications versus other catheters on the market. We see these complications very frequently. I think that the silk indwelling Foley catheter has a significant potential to improve the quality of life of patients who use a catheter to manage their bladder and to really decrease the burden on the healthcare system that's associated with catheter complications. So prior I was getting constant infections, so I was being hospitalized for infections. There was huge trauma to my bladder, so once we got this catheter, it was heaven sent. I haven't been hospitalized since. I haven't had any infections whatsoever, and this has given me quality of life and I can see the amount of lives it's changed. It's changed mine in a big way. We have engineered our treatment to react chemically with many materials to permanently transform their surfaces without modifying their bulk properties. The deposition process is rapid, is performed under ambient conditions, and does not require pretreatment, exotic reaction equipment, or toxic chemical solvents. This makes it possible to easily scale the treatment to commercial, economically viable levels of production. We are the first company in the world to be able to commercially transform the surface of silicone to create a more favorable interface with the human body. Cases and applications for Silk's groundbreaking coating technology appear endless. The possibilities include medical implants, lithium-ion batteries, water treatment, microfluidic devices, and more. At Silk, we've assembled a world-class team of scientists and accomplished leaders as executives and board members who drive strategy, development, execution, and who continuously enhance the value of the company. Silk does not have a one-size-fits-all product. Our scientists have been able to customize the formulation for each individual application, modifying surfaces to meet the needs of the particular environment. Our vision is to serve each customer's situation individually. And our business as a company is about providing a full-service turnkey coating solution to customers' wool. Thank you very much. So, so with that, uh, I would like to give everyone here in the audience the opportunity to ask questions. As you can see, we have uh, two very different stories here with two amazing outcomes of uh, uh, saving patients' life and improving quality of care. Um, any questions? We can bring you the microphone. Um, thanks so much for sharing your stories. I find them really inspiring, and congratulations on your work. Um, so I specialize in healthcare economic research, and I'm just curious to know how each of you thought about the potential. Um, you know, one thing I, I've learned is that unless there is an economic pathway for the product, it's hard for it to ever reach patients, right? There needs to be a business model that will support adoption. 
And when did you start thinking about that piece of it, like the, the business side and the economics that would make it possible for patients to access your product? I'm just curious to hear how you think about it. Thank you for your question. Um, I have to tell you that from, from a licensure perspective, um, when you look at it from that perspective, that issue becomes less of a, a burden for me. What I do know is that there is an unmet need and um, there was a, um, a clear advantage of this technology. There was a prototype in the market or, or there was a, a competitive uh, predicate in the market. For a catheter, um, the cost was in excess of $20,000. And um, when in my discussions with the CEO of the, the company and with the multiple analytics that they had done, we felt that there was no reason that, and there was a reason for it, it was a monopoly. And this technology was, we believe, was a superior technology, a superior platform, and the company felt that they could offer it for less than half of that price. And as such, it is now being used much more commonly than the, the original catheter was ever used. It has actually expanded the market for this field by being a bit more sensitive to uh, the margins and, and making it such that it can be broadly applied. Uh, I can't comment from a, a, com a, a company perspective. Maybe Dr. Kaner can, can say from that. Yeah. So. I've had a very different experience. We have what is essentially a platform technology. We can coat any medical plastic. And so then the question becomes, which is worth coating? And so we quickly figured out that catheters have the highest infection rate, 5% per day from the time you insert a catheter. And I didn't understand this, but many of you probably do, that everything you insert in the body grows a biofilm. And th things like your, your body actually has more bacterial cells than human cells. And once you put something in and that biofilm forms in it, things like E. coli, which can be harmless, can double every 20 minutes. And within a day, you can have so much E. coli that people start to get sick. Within a week, almost everybody will get sick. So the current way medicines practice is if you're going to have a catheter for more than a few days, they prescribe antibiotics. Terrible way to practice medicine, but all they can do. And so when we realized that, we figured catheters is the way to go. And that turns out to be a very large market. But we have a list of the next 20 medical devices and how big the market is. And so you can go down and you probably know what these devices are. But even why we're doing that, on the basic research side, we've been putting this with, with my colleagues in the medical school into mice. And we can reduce the amount of scar tissue dramatically. And so we think there's all sorts of implants that, that you could imagine that this coding could be used for. But you're right, it's, it's got to, there's got to be a business case. Otherwise, it, do, it doesn't work. Thank you. Any additional questions? Over there. Just going to ask a follow-up question to that. It is obvious that there should be an economic a pathway, but there are other concerns as you're starting a company, like the FDA approval, like the investment. So um, obviously it's a combination of those, but which took uh, the number one spot for you when you were starting for both of you? Which took number one spot? Oh, this is the easiest way to go through FDA, so let's pick this application with our technology rather than that application? Or was it, this is the biggest market, so let's, let's knock on that door and try to worry about the FDA and the investors later? So how, how did that go? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. We really did look at the market before, before we decided what to pursue, and because catheters were the largest market, where there's this huge infection rate, we figured that that would be the best place to go. And our original um, clearance by the FDA was for coatings. They don't, in, in the case of clearance, they're not so concerned about how well it works. They're concerned that it doesn't cause any problems with the patients. Because if it does, like if we're killing something, and I have friends who have started companies that kill things, then you have to do um, huge medical studies. And all we needed to do was to prove that for at least 30 days, 
that the, the things were totally inert. And of course, the negative thing that's tested is latex. And although there's many medical devices that are made out of latex, the about 10 to 15 percent of the population is allergic to it. So it, would, it wouldn't be allowed today, but it's been grandfathered in. So we had to show that our thing has no, no problems with the body and that our coating is permanent and doesn't come off. And then we got FDA clearance. Any uh, kind of in the journey that you've, uh, you've taken, any, any mistakes that were taken that happened to you along the way that you can advise the group here, say, hey, watch out, don't, don't, don't go down that path? Well, I think that uh, in my situation, I always wonder what it would, it would have been like if I had started my own company and taken it um, on my own or with, with the advice and with the help of others. But um, I, I don't regret that decision given that I have a more than a full-time job that makes it nearly impossible to do this sort of thing. I think that partnering with the right partner at the right time was the key to the success. And I, I don't have any regrets on that. So, so you were very modest at the beginning. Can you give us you know, kind of some numbers and statistics, statistics about the group you're leading here in UCLA? About my what? Your, your, the work you do in UCLA. You were very modest at the beginning, but give us, give us an understanding of how many transplantations do you do? Well, um, as some of you may know, UCLA is the largest, UCLA hospital, uh, is the largest solid organ transplant program in the country. We have done more solid organ transplants at UCLA than any other hospital um, cumulatively, more than 25,000. And, um, and the heart and lung transplant programs have been among the largest transplant programs in the US and the world, and, and most importantly, in terms of their outcomes. It is more likely for any patient to survive here than many other hospitals throughout the country, and that is one, one of the reasons that we have referrals throughout the country and throughout the world for patients with end-stage heart and lung disease that end up here at, at Ronald Reagan Hospital. And it's a, um, uh, it, it's a team effort. It is, there is no question that without the infrastructure, the talented team that we have here, we would not be able to do what we do every day. And um, as many of you know, COVID put a challenge to, for anybody in the healthcare, but this has been an incredible past two years for all of us here. And I think that uh, the credit has to go to the entire organization and everyone who works here that has uh, made it possible. So if I can add, I, I completely agree with you. It's really the team effort. You have to realize what you do and what your limitations are. And so I realize that I can do chemistry but I don't do business. And so I work with people who know how to raise money. I work with people who know how to sell products, how to market products. And all those skills are, are very different. And so you have to have a, have a team that's expert in, in all these areas. Great. Uh, Dr. Kaner, Dr. Adahali, thank you very much for your time. It's been a, an amazing talk, an inspiring talk.